Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. This week I want to talk about combat. Boy, that's one of those topics we talk about a lot here, right? It's one of those things that is a big part of gaming. No matter which game you're playing, it, you know, D&D-ish type game, whether you're playing a, an old school game, a new school game, a retro clone, whatever, there's this idea that combat can be really fun and exciting. Combat can be a slog and boring. And somebody, this came up recently in the Discord server, in my Discord server, so I kind of wanted to mention, this is not an exact quote, and I should have looked at it first, but I didn't. The Somebody said something to the effect of, well, any combat can be super cool narratively, but I'm talking about mechanically, because this is kind of a conversation that was going on. So here I'm going to touch on, I'm going to mostly focus on, as usual, more of the older games, because they don't tend to have these things built into them. Whereas if you play something with a lot more tactical, you know, feats and stuff, you may have these things in your game already. Maybe not. What I want to talk about here is the idea of how much do we want to give players as far as instruction on or options to do in combat and is giving them too many options just as problematic as giving them no options. What I mean by that is, in an ideal world, if you're playing with a lot of experienced players, let's say you're playing original Dungeons & Dragons or BX or OSC or Swords & Wizardry, whatever, and these players have been playing for a while and they come into a room and there's uh, it's a, a ballroom and there's tables and chairs and there's torches on the wall and it's a chandelier and there's a balcony and there's all these things and a combat erupts. Even though most systems don't give you specific rules for doing such things, a lot of experienced players will do things like knock the torches across the table to make the, you know, the oil lamps, let's say, across the table to start a fire, tip a table over to, to get cover, swing from a chandelier, right? That's always what people say. Pick up something, you know, pepper and throw it in somebody's face to blind them. They'll just do that knowing that the game is loose enough, the structure of the game is loose enough that the dungeon master, if they're being fair and reasonable and logical in a lot of ways, will adjudicate something that seems to make sense. It won't always work. It won't always be the best thing, but they'll try to make it work. That's just how we play the game or that's what you would think. Instead, what we tend to run into is a lot of people that go into the room and say, okay, cool. I hit them with my sword. Now, this is true with new players and also some experienced players. Sometimes people default back to what is the simplest thing because either they're trying to make combat go faster or they don't know what they can do or they can't trust that the DM is going to be fair. So it might be they're constantly wasting their time. All right, you hear these terms a lot. So here I'm going to go over some stuff and I'm going off the top of my head because I don't think any of the exact numbers and any of the exact systems is relevant here. You can look up these things and figure out what works for you. I just want to kind of talk about a few ideas. First, I'm going to talk about the idea of having some mechanics in the game, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of that. Then we're going to talk about not having mechanics and how we can kind of make this work. And we'll kind of do, as usual, something in the middle, a compromise as to what maybe is something that might work for you. When I first got back into playing, I was playing 5th edition, and one of the of Dungeons & Dragons, one of the very first games that I played that wasn't that was a game called Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Now, you can get this game as a free PDF with no art, and it's it's a pretty interesting retro clone. One thing they have is, and again, this is available only to fighters or fighter types, is they have something called a press attack, if I'm not oppress, but press attack, if I'm not mistaken, and a defensive attack, something like that. And effectively, what these do is they give a bonus to you, like in the uh, the press attack, you get a bonus to hit, but the enemy gets a bonus against you to hit you back. In the defensive, you use your bonus as your armor class. Basically, you can take defense. Those are simple things you can do. They're very basic. In my experience, people use them quite a bit, actually. They're easy. They're on the sheet. Only some characters, the ones that fight all the time, use them. So it's pretty practical. It's a little bit of a bonus. It, it's kind of like a lot of games have a charging attack. If you charge in, you get some kind of a you know bonus to your attack in the first round, or maybe you get to go first, but the enemy will get some kind of bonus against you. That's also pretty common in games. So here's a simple move that can happen. Now, how do we get players to use these things when they're not? Well, you have the enemies use them. That's the simplest way. That's going to be my answer to all of these. When players see the enemies charge in and the enemies get to go first, they're going to think, well, we could do that. Yes, you can. That's going to be something we got to keep in mind for all of this. Another system that I think is great and people always talk about 
and it is a great system, is Dungeon Crawl Classics. So if you're not familiar with Dungeon Crawl Classics, fighters, and I believe only fighters, not fighter types, have maybe maybe dwarfs, I don't remember, can do what's called Mighty Deeds. And what a Mighty Deed is, is, a, is effectively you're rolling a second die with your attack roll. That second die is your two hit and damage bonus, which is kind of cool. It makes that fighting kind of interesting. But also, if you score high enough on that die, then you can do what's called a Mighty Deed, which is effectively just something extra. You can trip somebody, you can push somebody, you can disarm somebody, you can blind somebody. And there's limitations to it. They have, you know, kind of a thing. Like if you're a first level character, you can't mighty deed blind a giant, right? You At least not permanently. You might be able to half blind them for a return. You know, so there's, there's a little more detail there. But effectively, it's open-ended. In my experience, and DCC people, please <laughs> comment, a lot of people don't use it all the time. I've played in lots of DCC games that I've run and that I've played in with groups online. And in addition to that, I've played in a bunch of convention games. And some players that are really like DCC players, that's what they play. They'll do it all the time. But a lot of players just, they won't know what to do, right? You'll say to them, okay, what mighty do you do? You're going to do this round when you make your attack. And they go blank. They don't, they don't know because they don't understand, again, what can I do? What is part of it? To DCC's credit, they give you a list of common ones. And they even say it's worthwhile to just have one in mind to just always do if you don't have another idea. So there is a resource there to use it. I think it's a good addition. You can add that to any game. That one's really good, and it's mechanically. Do we allow only fighters to do it? It's pretty powerful, so you might want to do that. One of my favorite games that I've run a full campaign in that you can watch the actual play if you'd like is Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea, now just called Hyperborea in 3rd edition. In Hyperborea, you have your normal kind of combat, you well, your charges and just attack with my sword, whatever. But then you also have advanced combat options, which are in a different section of the book and can be used if you want. They're optional. And these are interesting because these are things like two-weapon fighting. You can uh, like stick your arrows in the ground, if you're the setting arrows, I guess I call that. You can do like called shots. There's different things you can do. And some of them are ability score dependent. Some of them are class dependent. And some are not. Some anybody can do. What's nice here is you've got a menu to pick and choose from. Again, you don't have to come up with an idea. There's a list. I have a bow. I have some time. The enemy's far away. I'm going to spend a turn taking my arrows out of my quiver and setting them. Now for every round after that, I'm getting additional shots. That's basically what that does. I'm going to use two weapons. Here's the rules for it. I'm going to, I think they have a trip attack. I'm going to trip somebody. Oh, you know, this is, these are just rules for it. And again, there's limits. So it's not that anybody can do it, but when you look and you go, okay, well, I have a bow. These are my three moves that I can do with the bow, so I want to remember those, right? They are set down, and they're there, they're a menu. These are all great. The press attack and the defensive, the mighty deed of arms, the list of combat options are fantastic. However, does this, and I'm throwing this out there, I'd love to get some comments, does this potentially make people think they can't do other things? So if I have a disarm attack and a push attack, Can I also do a trip attack? Can I do a blind attack? If those aren't in the list, are they possible? How would I do them? And again, this could be an issue with some people. Some people will look at a list and go, this is what I can do. There's this thing where you've got these, you've got two groups. I mean, obviously there's more than two groups, but you know, there's like this two hands of this thing where the, there's one side that says, if it's not in the rules, I can't do it. And there's the other side that says, if it's not in the rules, that means I can do it because the rules aren't telling me I can't. I mean, you know, within reason. And somewhere in the middle is where most of us are. So I think some people fall into this idea that here's my list of four combat actions. That's what I can do. Like I used to play with people when I first played 5e that they would actually state their actions in that way. Action, bonus action, reaction. Like they would just say it like, because that's how they, they, in their mind, they were thinking, these are the things that I can do. Then you play with other people that say, my rogue is going to jump across the table, roll underneath, shoot my bow, and hide, right? And all of that is movement, uh, you know, uh, attack, bonus action, because they have the bonus action to hide, some rogues do. How you present it can be different depending on your players, and it's something we have to really consider. So let's talk about something that's more open-ended. In my game, Unchained, which is basically my table game that I play with my group, and just my general experience, 
I find that there are certain moves that the, we'll call them the creative players, the ones that when there's not a list, these are just things that people try to do. And I'll kind of go over what these are here and how you could adjudicate them, or maybe you'll turn them into an actual rule for your game. So number one thing people like to do, disarm. We have to be careful with a disarming attack because if your game doesn't have good grappling or fighting rules, knocking a weapon out of somebody's hand and then dropping them to a position where they can barely do any damage is incredibly powerful. So you cannot just do this willy-nilly like, I'm going to disarm them, okay, roll to hit their disarmed. That would be too powerful in most cases, right? What you want to do here is figure out a way to make it seem fair. Some kind of a post check, possibly the other side has to make a saving throw, usually a harder number to hit. You want to make it hard to disarm people because people don't want to lose their weapon, right? This shouldn't be something that people can just do easily, but it should be something people try to do. Let's jump right into grappling and wrestling. I think this, this is one of those areas where I do think a separate system is better. I've talked about it before. I'm pretty sure I made a video about it. If not, a podcast for sure, where I have my own system, which is based on something that Guy Gex wrote in an old magazine, Strategic Review, back in, I think, 1974 or 75. And it basically uses D6 dice pools. That's how I handle grappling and wrestling. I feel like that's it's so different than regular combat that I just don't think that having roll something a little different works for me. You might think it's just make an attack, bare hand attack, and if they fail their saving throw, you've wrestled them. That would also work. It depends on your game. But in my experience, disarming people and wrestling people to the ground are the things people want to do the most. Tied into that would be some kind of a trip attack. You don't want to dive on them and wrestle them, but you want to knock them prone. Because even if in your game... There's not, let's say, an advantage to attacking somebody who's on the ground. Narratively, there is. Finally, this is the one people always talk about when they talk about stuff. And again, I don't see as many people do these things in games as it seems there would be with all the discussion. The swing from the chandelier attack. Everybody always talks about swinging from the chandelier. How many chandeliers have you ever swung from in a game? I would love to know that. Let's get a chandelier count down below. But I'm going to call this the acrobatic attack. In other words, jumping down on somebody from a balcony, swinging across a rope, you know, sliding under a table to kick somebody underneath, you know, stuff that is like a feat of acrobatics. This is probably best suited to something, some kind of a dexterity check. Either depending on your system you're running, you might make a, a, a DC and roll with dexterity bonus. You might say roll under your decks or roll under half your decks if it's very difficult. This is something that people probably want to do a lot of, but don't use it. It's the thing that's not as firmly set. There is no specific attack here. It's just stuff that involves acrobatics. You can also count into this things like called shots, right? I'm going to use my bow to knock the feather out of their hat, right? That could also be this kind of feat of acrobatics, some extreme thing that isn't necessarily designed to just kill somebody. It's more of a flourish. I mentioned it with the Mighty Deed of Arms, and I think it's a good move that players sometimes use at my table more often than you would think is a blinding attack. The idea of putting something in somebody's face that will make them disor disorientated or, you know, blinded for a certain amount of time. This came up a lot when I used to do these random adventuring packs. I think I talked about this before. A lot of times you would get like these different dusts and powders in it and people would be like, oh, I have a bag of pepper. What do I do with that? Well, that's what you do with it, right? Well, how do you handle that? You know, for me, typically it's some kind of saving throw, uh, treat it like throwing oil. There's lots of ways to do it. But again, that's something you might want. Imagine having the party surrounding this young rogue you know, kid that pickpocketed them or whatever, and they're in thinking, oh, we're the party that we're going to get this guy. And then he opens up a bag of pepper and blinds your paladin, right? The party's going to remember that happened to them and they'll want to do that in the future. A blinding attack is a great fill-in kind of attack that I think I've seen a decent amount of time. Now, this final one, you might not call an attack, but it is something I see player characters try quite a bit or I see people talk about it. And some games have mechanics for it. And that is the intimidation. Now, that is to say, you take your sword out and you flourish it around or you you, you flex your, your muscles if you're Conan and you're all muscly and you're trying to get somebody to back down, to force a morale check effectively. How you handle this would be something to the effect of could be some kind of a charisma check. It could be based on just the actions. And this is something I wish more people would use. I think that it's one of those situations that we see in the fiction a lot where people don't just run in and start stabbing each other. There's lots of this back and forth and trying to get the other side to back down. And I think that an intimidation is a good skill type thing to have. I know that in some games that it's actually a feat to do this kind of thing. 
This I am 100% opposed to. I think that's just too specialized to me. I think anybody who has the position to do it should be able to try to intimidate somebody. And to me, that would just be them doing a thing. And if you want to make them roll for it, that's cool. And then it forces some kind of a morale check. Now, obviously, an enemy or whatever can't truly intimidate a PC because PCs don't have morales. If you're going to do something like this against the PCs, perhaps something like a wisdom save would be the way to go if you're using that kind of stuff or roll under your wisdom. That would probably be the saving throw I would use for that. I think that would work pretty well. One more tidbit I want to throw in here is something that comes from a game that I think is called The Adventure Game. I got it so long ago. I'm sure I have it on my shelf somewhere. If somebody knows what I'm talking about, Basically, the idea of this is you attempt things. You start with no skills and you attempt things throughout the game. And they're usually, I think it's a D6 based system. And if you succeed in it, you kind of mark a checkbox. And once you've succeeded in something a bunch of times, then from that point on, when you try to do it, you get a bonus when you're trying to do it. So that effectively you're gaining skill by doing it. Everybody starts without the ability to intimidate people, but you know, as a skill, right? Anybody can try to do it, but everybody starts without the skill. But if you intimidate enough people by flexing your muscles or swinging your sword, next, at a certain point when you keep doing it, you'll get bonuses. And you can keep having these bonuses stack eventually if you want. But ideally, the idea is that characters are playing their, or players are playing the characters in a way that they want to play them. And because of that, they are gaining abilities through play. It's not a list that we choose from. It's not something that's just in the book. It is really just what people are doing. You know what? You've climbed a rope a ton of times. You go to that move so many times now. I'm going to give you a bonus when you throw the grappling hook from this point on. This requires the table to be constantly in communication about what could be a skill, what can't be a skill. This is my ideal, to be honest. I don't do this exactly in my game. I, at least not mechanically, I do keep in mind and players do remind me when they, you know, I've done this a bunch of times, I do give them bonuses, but I don't have it set in stone. This is the kind of thing that I would like to have in a game. I think it's really nice. The other thing we can do here is if you feel like you have players that want to start with something, you could always have them pick one to start with, their like signature move. So I make a character, they are a fighter, I, you know, or whatever, you give a list of a D20 list of things to do, intimidate, trip, blind, they pick or roll. And now they've got a move that they have an advantage on. This gives everybody a little bit of flavor and it doesn't need to be class dependent. The reason why I say pick is because sometimes it might make sense if somebody's going to play a plate mail wearing, you know, cleric with a mace, and then they roll randomly and get, you know, crack shot with a bow. I mean, that's completely useless. They can't use a bow, right? And unless you want to go, well, okay, I guess this one cleric can use a bow. This is just not what you want to do generally. So I think I would probably have them roll, but if it's not appropriate, roll again, something like that. But I think this could work really well because now you're building a character that has something a little bit extra. And because it's that one thing on their sheet, they'll do it a bunch. It's not a list of 10 things in the book that they have to look up. It's not which one should I do. It's I throw salt in people's face or pepper, I guess, to make them sneeze and blinded. And that's my signature move. This I really like. So coming back around... I think there is no one solution to this. I think the solution comes down to the table, the game you're playing, and the nature of it. If you find that all of your players are just saying, I hit them with my sword and never trying something, I think the way to handle that is to have the enemies do it. Have the enemies hide behind cover. Have the enemies jump from above or swing from chandeliers. Have the enemies throw stuff in the PC's faces. Let them see that that can work. And if you get somebody that's like, well, that's not fair, you could say, you could do it right? Have them do it. They will learn that these things can be done. And when the PCs want to do something, try to give them a chance. Even if you say that doesn't really make sense. Fine. You have a bowl of pepper on the table. This guy's got a, a plate mail on with a, with the helmet. There's only a small slit. You just tell them that. Well, you realize there's just a small slit there that might not work so well. And then you figure out the numbers, but let them try it. Let them do stuff. Don't say you can't do this. That action can't work. No, I'm not saying every move should work. What I'm saying is there should be a chance to do things that are realistic to the game in the situation that's there. If I want to run across, if I if I have initiative and the, a bunch of bowmen have arrows pointed at me, 
I should be able to have a chance to run to the table, flip the table up, throw my axe maybe, and then duck behind it, or maybe some of those moves, right? There should be a chance I can pull that off. And if I do, awesome. Now I have cover and a bunch of arrows at the table and we have a cool cinematic scene. If the DM says, well, no, that's too many moves. You can't do that. Or they're going to get passed through fire and it will make it so PCs don't want to try stuff. Sometimes you've got to slightly be more open to, we'll say, bending the rules to let cool things happen. Just make sure that you're doing it fairly, that you're doing it with all the players and that, again, the enemies to some level will be able to do it as well. Keep the game more narratively open but make sure that you have mechanics in mind so if you want to do these things or your players want to, that you'll have at least some way to work it out. And one kind of final thing I want to say here, and I think this is really important and maybe something people don't do, and maybe this is one of the reasons why people feel intimidated when they run games. If you don't know as a DM how you would handle something, it is not a bad idea just to ask the person trying it or other people at the table. I can tell you, at least in my group, that most of the time they are pretty fair. I have found plenty of times where somebody wanted to do something and I'm like, oh, I don't really know. And I would pull the table and some of the people at the table would be like, yeah, no, that's that, that can't work or it should be a penalty for this. And they'll be honest with it. They don't want their side to lose, right? They don't want to hurt the other player. Just make sure you're playing with a group that's not you know, like that, PvP people. But at the same time, I think they want the world to make sense. They want it to feel cool in the fiction. They've watched cool fiction. They want to engage in this stuff. They want to see it, right? So if I say they're going to shoot at you as you run towards the table, unless you make a reflex save, let's say if we're in DCC, or unless you we're going to roll a second initiative, and if you roll beat them again, I'll let you get to the table first. That's fine. You know, why not? Let to have it happen. It doesn't break the game to do it. and It's a cool thing to try. The table where you're running behind and getting covered, just in case I, I lost you there. <laughs> Anyways, I would love to know what you think about this. I think it's a fascinating subject. I think that my general way of playing is generally more the play it by ear, but I totally understand how lists of things can work for some people. If that works for you, let me know below. Let me know systems you use or games that have these. That would be cool to know and to look into. If you haven't already, please do check the show notes. You're going to find a link to my Discord server over there. Discord server is great. This is where this conversation came from. Lots of people over there talking gaming and other things. And check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel. I'll talk to you soon.